Hello, everyone. Hello? Wake up. There we go. Um, before I get started, I'm going to make a confession. And it's a secret that I've carried for nine years now since I've had this job. And it's something that I think some of you out there may share with me. And that is, I don't like kale. <laughs> really, I don't get it. I'm, I'm glad I got that off my chest. Um, how many of you shop at green markets or other farmers markets? Raise your hand. All right, congratulations, thank you. But I bet you didn't know that by doing that, you are part of the 1%. Before I talk a little bit about that, I'm gonna tell you a little about Green Market. Green Market was started 35 years ago by a dynamic duo. Oh, no, not those guys. These guys. Bob Lewis and Barry Benepe. And Bob and Barry wanted to save farms in the Hudson Valley and beyond, and they wanted to connect New Yorkers to healthy, fresh produce. So they created Green Market. And from the beginning, green markets were a hit with New Yorkers. In fact, the first green market, which opened not at Union Square, most people think, it's, it was over at 59th and 2nd Avenue, was so popular the first day, people were grabbing out the produce, and it was a little bit crazy, that one of the founding fathers asked Bob afterwards, is there a famine going on? <laughs> so let's flash forward 35 years to today. Now, there are over 130 farmers markets in New York City now. 50 or so of those are green markets. And these farmers markets are wonderful things. They preserve farmland, and more than that, they keep farmland in production. And they support family farms. And you know, not only that, but more recently, they've been playing a key role in fighting obesity and diet-related diseases through accepting food stamps and also a wonderful program created by the Department of Health called Health Bucks. And those are $2 certificates, so every time you go to a green market, use your EBT, you get $2 as a match. That's a 40% increase in your buying power. It evens out the cost between overprocessed and healthy food. And it hopefully answers once and for all that if all things are even, fruit can beat out Fruit Loops, which is terrific. We can't talk about farmers markets unless we talk about farmers. So let's talk about one of our green market farmers, who I will call Fred, mainly because that's his real name. Now Fred, Fred and his family have been farming in a place called Pancake Hollow, New York for the last 150 years. And their farm was doing great for decades. They were selling apples to grocery stores and, and that was going terrific. But then in the early 80s, something happened. Grocery stores started consolidating purchasing. They started buying apples from outside the state and Fred's farm and their way of life was in trouble. Yes, it's hard to believe there was trouble in Pancake Hollow. <laughs> so Fred did something radical at the time. He moved from wholesale and decided to join Green Market. And remember, this is in the early 80s. He started selling these apples in Brooklyn. And you know, Brooklyn's a better place than it was back then. You know, it's, uh, back, you know, it's changed a lot. And so he stuck his neck out and did it. You know, Brooklyn today is you know, terrific and it's full of foodies, many of them here. You know, all of you are fedora-wearing local vores who, you know, love to shop at our markets. And that saved Fred's farm. He was able to turn it around. And the farm grew, and it not only prospered, but it went from 40 to 200 acres. And today, Fred's family is not just growing apples. They have pears and blueberries and cherries and baked goods. And Fred's son, Albert, even created a hard cider company, which is perhaps appropriately named Bad Seed. So farmers markets have exploded across the country. They've gone up dramatically in the last 20 years. And that's just been great for farmers. Farmers markets connect people to the people who grow their food. They build relationships, and they, a lot of the times, they're the only chance for city dwellers to understand rural communities and the people who live there. I like to call farmers markets the gateway drug to local. But if farmers markets are doing so great, why are we still losing farms? According to the American Farmland Trust, we lose a farm every three and a half days. That's an incredible and scary number. And maybe it's because farmers market CSAs and farm stands make up 1% of what Americans eat. 
Think about that. The other 99% goes through wholesale channels. And what's a wholesale channel? That's a restaurant, a grocery store, a hospital, the list goes on and on, schools, et cetera. Let's look at this another way. And another. <laughs> my, my comptroller liked this joke the best. I'll tell you that right now. So, so think about what you ate this week. Maybe you woke up in the morning, you went to a deli, you, bought, you got a bagel and some fruit, you got a salad on your lunch break, um, you ordered in Chinese food or went to your favorite bistro in the evening. All of that food traveled through a wholesale channel. Our farming community has been divided up into two as of late. You have small farmers who are able to sell retail, who have diversified crop plans, like Fred has done, moved from apples to multiple products, who can sell at farmers markets. And then you have an industrialized system that, go, that favors large industrial sized farms so that the produce, like your salad, can go from the farm, unlikely a farm that cute, but it was free clip art, so I used it, um, to a wholesaler, to a wash, chop, and bag facility, to the salad bar, to your plate. And all along the way, the farmer lost value and the price went up. This is the American way. Yes, it's for-profit companies run our system. But it has downsides. For the small farmers, they can't compete, and the mid-sized farmers, they can't compete with the price that comes from industrialized farms, so they can't get in this market. And for consumers, it often means that the worst produce ends up in the poorest neighborhoods at the highest cost. Something is happening to change it. You heard a little bit about it earlier, and it's called food hubs. And food hubs, I'll admit, they're not perfect. Some survive, some don't. But for small and mid-sized farmers right now, it's all we have. Now, I wrote this down because it's very long. USAID defines a business organization that actively manages, forget it. Um, a food hub <laughs> is a simple concept. It's a group of people or an individual that's got together and decided to go outside the wholesale system, sell farm products to consumers in a way that doesn't harm farmers or doesn't harm the consumer. They want to treat both fairly. And that's terrific. We had to decide to go out that system when we created our youth market program. Now, youth markets are teen-run farm stands. And we created them because green markets can't survive in every part of the city because the farmer may not make enough money. So what do you do? You set up a stand, you provide them wholesale product, you teach them how to run a, a, a stand, and everybody wins. It's a triple win. But in order to get them the vegetables, we needed to create a food hub. So we created Green Market Co. Green Market Co. aggregates produce from multiple farmers and distributes it to multiple places, like great restaurants like Tom's or um, Gramercy Tavern, and institutions like the Lenox Hill Neighborhood House which is one of my favorite stories because Lenox Hill, before they started buying from our food hub, 90% of what they made was made with frozen and canned vegetables. The chef there, Lynn, has been able to change that menu into a 90% that is fresh and local, which is pretty amazing. But in order to use our food hub to help our food access programs, you have to buy the produce at a good price. This is what I call sweet corn economics. If we buy a tractor trailer load of corn from a farmer, a big regional farmer, we can get it for a third the cost if we buy it from a crate. And we can pass those savings on to the consumers at youth markets and other locations. But in order to do that, you need infrastructure. You need a lot of unsexy stuff. You need a warehouse and a forklift and some pallet racks and trucks, like this one. And the reason the guy from Green Market has a Cisco truck up is because it reminds me of three things. One. The big boys have already made these investments. They've bought the infrastructure. Two, this truck, I was standing out on a street corner with Olivia, who runs our food hub, and it drove by, and she looked up inside, and I said, what's the matter? And she said, you know, I never thought when I was getting into a job when I was in college a few years ago that I'd have one that caused truck envy. And it was this <laughs> truck that did it. But then, after I took the picture, I looked at it a little more closely, and I noticed that there were plantains and yucca on their New York local truck. <coughs> now, I've been to a lot of farms <laughs> in the Hudson Valley. I have yet to see plantains or yucca growing in one of them. So some advertising person made a mistake, but we'll forgive him for that. This is something that my Green Market um, staff like to co call FOCAL, which stands for fake local. <laughs> you can hashtag that out if you want. But 
So we were able to open up our food hub. We were able to get a little investment from the state and some foundations. And in doing that, we've been able to move a, a million pounds of local produce to the market in New York City, which is over $800 million, or probably more. That doesn't include institutions. And we've been able to help 50 farmers in the process. And one of those farmers is Fred. Because now Fred is not only selling retail, he's selling wholesale because Green Market Co. can give him a good price for his product. So how do we scale up? How do we make more Freds? How do we move from 1% to 5% to 50%? Well, two ways. First off, all of you here, and the 15 or so people I expect to want to watch me on YouTube, <laughs> two of them being my parents, <laughs> you need to, the next time you go to a restaurant, or you go to a grocery store, ask them a simple question. Is anything here from a local farm? That'll keep driving demand, like you all do at, at farmers markets. And the second thing is that all our nonprofit leaders, our foundations, and our government folks need to realize that in order to connect mid-sized farms, which are the fastest disappearing part of our farming community, and they used to make up 70% of our farms, and they're the ones that can get us from 5% to 50%, you need to find a way to give them the infrastructure to do that, whether it's a food hub or some other way. And it needs to be an investment that is big and long-term because we have to compete with these guys. Now, I joked around a little and made fun of Cisco. And you know, actually, I'm a little worried that there's going to be a Cisco Black Hawk helicopter over my house tonight. Um, but this is a real problem about real people about our farmers who are disappearing. The mid-sized farmers, the ones who can help us the most, the ones who don't grow and want to get in the wholesale, but they can't because they're priced out. And I know it's real because three of them are here today, all the way from Pancake Hollow. Fred, Becky, Albert, come on up. I'm not done yet. <laughs> now I get to my inspirational closing. So if you could dim the lights and up. No, you don't do, you don't do that. OK. <laughs> Sorry. By focusing on what matters most, all of us can save farms. We can't. I wrote it down, so I don't forget it. So we, can, we can by creating a new wholesale system with a mission, a system that avoids the mistake of the past, a wholesale system with a heart, one that treats farmers fairly, increases access to all communities, and values people as much as profits. If we do that, everyone, everyone here, all of you, people watching, me, Fred and his family, can be part of the 99%. Thank you. <laughs>